Mr. Speaker, sir. Recently, we witnessed a series of high-profile public cases involving political office holders. Members have asked several questions regarding these cases. Let me give the House an account of how these issues have been dealt with and why. After that, Minister Chan Chun Singh will address the more detailed questions in his statement. On the CPIB investigation involving Minister Iswaran, briefly, the facts of the case are these. While investigating a separate matter, CPIB came across some information concerning Minister Iswaran that merited investigation. CPIB alerted me on the 29th of May and pursued this lead further on their own volition. On the 5th of July, Director CPIB briefed me on the findings he had at that point. He told me that CPIB would need to interview Minister Iswaran to take the investigation further, and he sought my concurrence to open a formal investigation. I gave my concurrence the next day, the 6th of July. On the 11th of July, Minister Iswaran was brought in by CPIB and subsequently released on bail. I instructed him to take leave of absence until the investigations were completed. Subsequently, I interdicted Minister Iswaran from duty with a reduced pay of $8,500 per month until further notice. Such incidents involving ministers are rare and there is no rule or precedent on how to effect an interdiction on a political office holder. Hence, I use the current civil service practice as a reference point. The specific details in Minister Iswaran's case follow generally how the civil service would deal with a senior officer in a similar situation. But this was my decision as Prime Minister because the political context for a minister and a civil servant being investigated and interdicted are different. I should point out that CPIB investigations are still ongoing. I am unable to provide more details on the case so as not to prejudice the investigations in any way. I ask members of this House and the public to refrain from speculation and conjecture. We must allow CPIB to do its work to investigate the matter fully, thoroughly and independently. When the investigation is completed, CPIB will submit its findings to the Attorney General's chambers, which will decide what to do with them. Whichever way the facts come out, the case will be taken to its logical conclusion. That has always been our way. Next on the resignations of former Speaker Tan Chuan Jin and former MP Cheng Li Hui. Let me recap some basic facts that are mostly already public. I first learnt of their relationship sometime after the 2020 general election, in fact, in November 2020. They were both spoken to and counselled separately. They both said they would stop the affair, but as it turned out, they did not. Most recently, in February 2023, I spoke to them again, separately. Mr Tan admitted that what he did was wrong. He offered to resign. I accepted. But I told him that before he actually resigned, I had first to make sure residents in Kembangan Chai Chi, his ward, and Marine Parade, his GRC, were taken care of. Meanwhile, his relationship with Ms Cheng had to stop. A few weeks ago, I came across information that strongly suggested that the affair had continued. I decided that Mr Tan had to go forthwith. Ms Cheng had to resign too because she had not broken off the affair even after being told to stop. I have been asked, why did I take so long, more than two years, to act? It's a fair question. In retrospect, and certainly now knowing how things eventually turned out, I agree. I should have forced the issue sooner. But let me explain my general approach as well as my thinking at that point in time. These sorts of relationships happen from time to time. 
They have happened in the past and no doubt will happen again in the future. In such cases, what we do depends on many factors. The circumstances, how inappropriate or scandalous the behaviour was, the family situations. We also have to be conscious of the impact on innocent parties, particularly their spouses and children. I had explained this at my press conference on the 20th of July. So did DPM Lawrence Wong last week in a BBC interview. This is not a new position. It reflects the PAP's long-standing practice since the days of Mr Lee Kuan Yew. There is no single template that applies to all extramarital affairs, but there can be at least three situations. The first situation is where the individuals involved will be talked to, and if they stop, the matter ends there. No further action need be taken. The second situation, where immediate action has to be taken. For example, when one party has supervisory power over the other party, and we have in the past taken immediate action in a few cases. Third situation, where the relationship raises some questions of propriety beyond it being an extramarital affair per se. The parties will be talked to, but the matter cannot end there. Even if the affair stops, some action has to follow. But what that action is and when it is taken depends on the nature of the facts and the boundaries that have been transgressed. The present situation falls into this third category. It's wrong. Mr Tan and Ms Cheng had to stop their affair. I told them to stop. In deciding what more should be done, consider this. Would we object to the speaker, to having the speaker being married to an MP? Would we object to having a speaker being married to an MP? I think the answer is no. That would be perfectly all right. There is no direct reporting line between the speaker and an MP. Thus, an open, legitimate relationship between the speaker and an MP is not in itself objectionable. Hence, this situation of the speaker having an affair with an MP does not fall into the category where immediate action has to be taken. However, the speaker has some official capacity vis-a-vis -vis MPs. An extramarital affair between him and an MP is therefore problematic. It puts other MPs and staff in an awkward position, and it is just not proper. After I spoke to Mr Tan in November 2020, he told me that the relationship would end. I took it to be so. I therefore felt there was some leeway to take some time to decide what further steps to take. In this context, the possible actions that could have followed were on the basis that the extramarital affair had stopped, I would have asked Mr Tan to step down as Speaker sometime before the end of the term, but in a way which would reduce the public embarrassment to him and his family. As to whether one or both should also resign as MPs, I hadn't decided at the time, but quite likely both would have had to leave at some point. But give, by giving the matter some time, I had hoped to give them a softer exit and save them and their families the pain and embarrassment that they are suffering now. I place much weight on protecting their families, perhaps too much. Regrettably, in the end, Mr Tan and Ms Cheng did not stop the affair and both had to go. On reflection, as I said, I should have forced the issue earlier, certainly before midterm. Let me add a personal plea at this point. While there is no doubt the two persons behaved improperly, there are also innocent family members involved. Likewise, for the case involving a former member across the aisle in the Workers' Party, all their families are suffering. I hope that MPs and the public can empathise and have compassion for the families and give them the privacy and space they need to heal.
Mr. Speaker, sir, there has been a great deal of public interest over the recent series of incidents, CPIB arresting and investigating a, mem a minister, MPs resigning, and before that, the allegations about the ride-out rentals. The way we have handled these incidents shows how seriously the PAP takes our responsibility of governing Singapore and being accountable to Parliament and to Singaporeans. Let me assure members, when such issues come up, we will deal with them properly and transparently, as we have done, with the ride-out rentals, when allegations of preferential treatment surfaced, the two ministers involved were thoroughly investigated, including by CPIB, and eventually fully exonerated. The investigation reports were tabled in Parliament, and we had a long session answering MPs' questions in this House. When CPIB discovered on its own that it had reason to arrest and interview a minister, it opened a formal investigation. Nobody tipped them off. There had been no public scandal. CPIB came across something that needed investigating and proceeded to do their job. When the Speaker of Parliament and a government MP fell short of the standards of propriety and personal conduct expected of them, they were asked to resign. We took some time to sort it out, probably longer than we should have, but we did what we needed to do and put the situation right. The two CPIB investigations and the response to the personal misconduct case show two aspects of how this PAP government works. One, when there is suspicion or allegation of wrongdoing in the discharge of official duties, especially possible corruption, there is zero tolerance. Two, when people slip in their personal lives, the PAP will look at the facts of each case carefully and deal with the matter as humanely and sensitively as possible according to the principles that the party has established. Systems are composed of human beings. In any system, however comprehensive the safeguards, sometimes something will still go wrong. The PAP government does our utmost to minimize that possibility. We work hard to identify the right people to bring into politics and appoint into responsible positions. We vet them carefully, test and stretch them before entrusting them with heavier responsibilities. Often they measure up, but sometimes they fall short. Occasionally they transgress norms of conduct or commit wrongdoing. Singapore has seen corruption cases involving political office holders in the past. Mr. Tan Kia Gan, in 1966, he was then Minister of National Development. Mr. Wee Tun Boon, in 1975, he, went, he was then a Minister of State, I think in the Ministry of Defence. Mr. Tae Chiang Wan, in 1986, he was Minister for National Development. And earlier, in 1979, Mr. Fei Yukok, then President of NTUC and also an MP. All these cases were handled by Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, who was then Prime Minister, thoroughly, transparently, and applying the full force of the law. That's still how the PAP government deals with such cases. It's not changed under my charge, and it won't change under my successor either. Now, Mr. Speaker, sir, with your permission, may I say a few words in Mandarin? Yi Zhang Xian Sheng, Ren Min Xing Dong Dang, Yi Zhi Yi Lai, Zhi Li Yu Wei Chi, Qing Lian Zheng Zhi. Yi Ge Lian Jie de Zheng Fu, Liang Hao de Zhi Li Ti Si, Dui Wo Men de Min Zhu Zhi Du, Zhi Guan Zhong Yao. In Si, 我们制定严厉的法律制度
最近发生的几件事就体现了这一点，但也反映了我们决心维护廉政的原则，坚决反贪的立场。我们确信，要继续维持廉洁的政治体系，要让人民继续信任人民行动党政府，我们必须不隐瞒事实，公开处理问题。因此，如果任何人，包括部长或议员，涉嫌贪污或违法的行为时，我们绝不姑息，一定会查的水落石出。如果调查结果证实当事人并没有不妥当的行为，也没有任何利益冲突，事情就会了结，还他一个清白。如果调查发现当事人犯错，我们会按照法律采取。严厉的行动。至于个人的行为操守，人民行动党对部长和议员的要求是：大家必须能够分辨是非，严以律己。但是，有关个人行为不检的事件，情况都不一样，所以我们会因事制宜。例如，前议长跟前议员。发生了婚外情，这是不应该发生的。当时我希望他们能够妥善的结束关系，因为事件一旦暴露，就会严重的伤害到家人。在整个过程中，我的重要考量是这个事件对他们的家人的影响。如果他们当时就结束关系，他们不用在这么不堪的情况下离开政坛，导致家人受到伤害。可是很遗憾，他们最终还是没有好好的处理。现在回顾这件事的发展，如果可以重新处理这个事件，我会更早做个了断。在任何婚外情事件，家人必然会被牵累，很可能受到重大打击。我希望，无论是涉及行动党或工人党议员的事件，大家能够尊重当事人和他们家人的隐私，给予他们时间和空间来面对。我们不能排除这种事情有一天再次发生的可能性。当类似事件发生时，我们依然会按照人民行动党一贯的原则来处理。我和我的团队都清楚地知道，维持清廉政治风气对我们的民主制度至关重要。我们会一如既往保持自律，坚持廉政的原则。这是人民行动行动党政府的承诺。Let me assure Singaporeans that we will protect the integrity of our system of government. For the good of our country, we will carry through what needs to be done in accordance with the law, even if it may be politically embarrassing and painful to the party. I will not flinch or hesitate to do my duty to keep our system robust and clean. This is how the PAP government can continue to deserve the trust that Singaporeans have placed upon us. I have spoken often about how precious trust is and how crucial it is for our democracy to work well. The founding generation built up Singapore and entrusted it to our generation in good shape. It is incumbent on us to protect and uphold this system to keep it incorruptible and clean and maintain high standards of propriety. With the investigation into Minister Iswaran, and their resignations of the Speaker and an MP, the PAP, has taken a hit. But we will show Singaporeans that we will uphold standards and do the right thing, so that trust is maintained and the Singapore system continues to work well. This is my approach, and I'm confident it will be my successor's approach too. And this is how we will keep Singapore safe, strong, and prosperous for many years to come. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister Chan Chun Singh will be making a related ministerial statement. 
I will allow clarifications to be raised on both statements after the statement by Minister Chan. Minister Chan. Mr. Speaker, sir, I will take the parliamentary questions relating to the CBIP case and the Public Service Code of Conduct together. Several members, Dr. Tan Wu Ming, Ms. Joan Pereira, Mr. Leong Man Wai, Mr. Gerard Giam, and Mr. Dennis Tan, have posed questions relating to timelines and circumstances surrounding the CPIB investigations involving Minister Iswaran and on the information put out in the initial statements by the government. I must emphasize that what information to put out on ongoing investigations are operational judgment calls that law enforcement agencies take. Other parties, including ministers, defer to the judgment of these agencies and do not and should not independently release such information. Those familiar with how law enforcement agencies operate, including CPIB, will know how they usually make their announcements. The standard practice is that agencies do not disclose the names of persons who are being investigated or arrested. And there are good reasons for this. Say someone has been picked up, arrested, and investigations are ongoing. If it is immediately announced that the person has been arrested and is being investigated, it may prejudice the person. The impression that he has done wrong will be there. Even if subsequent investigations do not result in any charges being brought against him. Thus, to be fair to the persons involved, law enforcement agencies generally refrain from immediately naming the persons being investigated. There are situations where agencies will depart from this norm and mention names. In Minister Iswaran's case, given that it involved a minister, CPIB decided to disclose on 12 July that Minister Iswaran was assisting CPIB with investigations into a case uncovered by CPIB. At that point, CPIB did not state that Minister Iswaran had been arrested, as it had wanted to at first establish more facts of the case, including hearing his side of the story. These are decisions for CPIB to make. What law enforcement agencies, including CPIB, review at any point in time takes into account their operational considerations in the cases they deal with, including preserving the integrity of evidence, protecting the confidentiality of ongoing investigations, and avoiding impact on other related parties. This is why the Prime Minister's initial statement and Deputy Prime Minister's doorstop interview on 12 July took reference from CPIP's press release on the same day. This was the proper thing to do because ministers including the Prime Minister, should not reveal more than what the law enforcement agencies are prepared to disclose. While ministers do have the final decision-making power, they will usually take the advice of the law enforcement agencies. Two days later, on 14 July, Hotel Properties Limited or HPL issued a statement saying that Mr Ong Beng Singh had been given a notice of arrest by CPIB. The media asked CPIB about this. By then, investigations had been ongoing for three days and CPIB had obtained more facts. CPIB made the operational judgment call that it would be appropriate at that point in time to confirm that both Mr Ong and Minister Iswaran had been arrested. Some members, Mr Saktiandi Supat, Mr Gerard Giam, Ms He Ting Ru, have asked about the considerations for timely and mandatory disclosure of information about a political office holder who is under investigation. The primary considerations are what I have just outlined. Singaporeans are understandably concerned about this matter. In due course, further details of the investigations will be made public. But I hope we can all recognise that we must give CPIB the time and space they need to do their work. This was a case that CPIB had uncovered by themselves. We can rely on CPIB to conduct its investigations thoroughly and independently, and to see this case to its logical conclusion, as it has with every other case it has investigated over 70 years. May I caution members that CPIB investigations are still ongoing? 
Minister Iswaran has not been charged, much less convicted. Members should therefore avoid speculating on or prejudicing the outcome of the investigations. Mr Leong Man Wai and Mr Louis Chua asked whether all CPIB investigations required the Prime Minister's concurrence and if CPIB is obliged to seek the Prime Minister's concurrence to open formal investigations of potential offences that CPIB has uncovered. While CPIB reports directly to the Prime Minister, it is functionally independent. CPIB does not require the Prime Minister's concurrence to conduct its investigations. In this case, it kept the Prime Minister informed and sought his concurrence to initiate formal investigations of Minister Iswaran because the investigations concern a Cabinet Minister. The Prime Minister concurred within a day of receiving Director of CPIB's report. Under Article 22G of the Constitution, in the event the Prime Minister refuses to give his consent to a CPIB investigation, the Director of CPIB can go directly to the elected President for his or her concurrence to proceed with the investigations. In reality, we have never had a Prime Minister who has impeded CPIB's work. I should also remind members there are constitutional safeguards for the appointment or removal of the Director of CPIB which require the concurrence of the President. There were also several queries by Dr Tan Wu Ming, Mr Leong Man Wai, seeking more details on CPIB's investigation findings. Members must remember that this is an ongoing investigation, therefore I am unable to disclose further details at this juncture. This is to ensure that the investigations are not jeopardised and affected individuals or entities are not prejudiced. Mr Don Wee asked why Minister Shamugan and Minister Vivian continue with their duties while being investigated by CPIB on the readout bungalow issue. There is a crucial difference between that earlier CPIB investigation into Ministers Shamugan and Vivian and CPIB's ongoing investigation involving Minister Iswaran. For the readout bungalow matter, the two ministers had asked the Prime Minister for an independent investigation into their rental of SLA black and white bungalows, and the Prime Minister had tasked CPIB to do the investigation. The Prime Minister had no reason to believe that the Ministers had committed any wrongdoing then, and therefore saw no need to put them on leave of absence during the investigation. The CPIB investigation subsequently cleared both Ministers. The Prime Minister could have asked the ministers to take leave of absence should evidence have surfaced during the investigations that warranted it. For the case involving Minister Iswaran, CPIB came across some information concerning him while investigating a separate matter. It then decided it should look further into the matter. In these circumstances, Prime Minister's assessment was that it was necessary to suspend Minister Iswaran from his official duties while the investigation took place. Mr Leong Man Wai asked whether Minister Iswaran's gazetted leave of absence from his duties from 7 to 9 July was related to the CPIB's investigation. For the record, Minister Iswaran took leave of absence from 7 to 9 July for personal matters. Senior Minister of State Cheong Tat covered his duties during that period. The leave of absence arising from the CPIB investigation was effected only on 12 July. Next. On the Code of Conduct for Ministers, Mr Zukanian asked if there will be a review of the Code. The Code of Conduct for Ministers has been in place since 1954 and was last updated in 2005. The Code sets out the principles and rules on how ministers should act and conduct their personal affairs. The general principles remain valid. We will continue to review and update the Code of Conduct for Ministers regularly, taking into account evolving circumstances and needs. For example, the government recently announced that going forward, officers with access to privileged information that can or influence the outcome of decisions related to state-owned properties must make a declaration before they can rent government properties managed by their agencies. The same would apply to political office holders. Let me now address the questions raised by Mr Yip Hon Wing, Ms Hazel Pua, Mr Dennis Tan, and Mr. Gerard Giam relating to the Public Service Code of Conduct 
and avenues for public officers to report wrongdoing and protection of whistleblowers. The Public Service Code of Conduct sets out the principles and rules that public officers must abide by. It is periodically refreshed to ensure that the integrity and high standards of the public service are upheld. In the course of their work, public officers may come across different requests, be it from colleagues, friends, members of the public, or political office holders. When handling these requests, officers are expected to maintain a high level of professionalism and safeguard the confidentiality of official information as well as the political impartiality of the public service. Should an officer be unsure of a request because it seems inappropriate or unrelated to official work, he should consult and seek guidance from his supervisor. If the request comes from his supervisors or a more senior officer, the officer can escalate the matter appropriately through the chain of command, including directly to his permanent secretary, the head of agency, the head of civil service, or the minister in charge of the public service. The code of conduct is reinforced through various channels such as annual quizzes, declarations, induction programs for new entrants, milestone programs, and regular service-wide reminders. There is an established internal disclosure policy framework within the civil service, where officers can report any wrongful practices that they have observed in their ministry to their permanent secretaries. Statutory boards have their own equivalent processes. All reports are treated with utmost confidentiality and every effort is made to protect the officer's identity. There is a non-retaliation clause to further protect the interests of the officer who made the report. If a report is made in good faith, no action will be taken against the reporting officer even if the investigation finds no wrongful practice. Between 2020 and 2022, no report which surfaced through this channel was referred to the CPIB for investigation. In addition, there is a public service protocol for the reporting of corruption. Under this protocol, public officers are expected to directly report to the police or the CPIB at the earliest opportunity when they learn of any act of corruption or have reasons to believe that such an act may have been committed in their ministries. The identity of the person making the report will be kept confidential. This is provided for under the Prevention of Corruption Act. CPIB also accepts anonymous reports. CPIB treats all reports received seriously, whether the complainant is named or anonymous. Of the 83 cases registered for investigation in 2022, 13, or about 16%, were from anonymous sources. Public sector cases form a small proportion, form a small portion of the cases CPIB investigates each year. In 2022, four public sector officers were prosecuted in court for offences investigated by CPIB. Mr. Gerard Giam asked about the rules for declaring meal invitations and the threshold values for doing so. The rules for the civil service on accepting gifts and hospitality are designed to maintain incorruptibility and to prevent officers from becoming beholden to any person or organisation. Civil servants must declare to their permanent secretaries any gifts they receive from external stakeholders on account of their official position or work. Officers may be allowed to retain gifts that are valued below $50 if doing so does not affect the integrity of the civil service. If officers wish to retain gifts valued above $50, they must pay the assessed market value of the gift to the government. In the course of their work, officers may be invited to meals by local or foreign stakeholders. They may accept when there are legitimate work-related reasons or when it is impractical or impolite to reject the meal. Unlike gifts, it is more difficult to ascertain the value of a meal. In such instances, civil servants should declare and seek approval from their permanent secretaries if they receive any meal invitation, either before the meal or, if that is not possible, immediately after. This is especially if they assess that the value of the meal or hospitality is incongruent with the professional nature of the meeting and may give rise to perceptions of influence peddling and conflict of interest, real or perceived. I should share with this House that civil servants are sensitised on these matters, that even when they receive gifts of fruits or sweets, as is customary on many of our festive occasions, such gifts are usually distributed in the agency or to a community organisation. We do not keep them. 
Political office holders adopt a similar spirit and principles in their official activities. There are specific rules spelled out in the Annex of the Code of Conduct for Ministers on the acceptance of gifts and services. In general, all gifts should be refused and returned to the donor without delay. If the return of the gift is impractical, the gift must be handed over to the political office holders' ministry to be dealt with in accordance with official guidelines. If political office holders want to retain a gift, they will have to pay the government for it at the valuation price. Otherwise, the gifts have to be surrendered to the government. Mr. Speaker, sir, I've come to the end of my responses. May I suggest that the House seek clarifications in three segments? The first segment is on our principles of governance and ministers' conduct. The second segment can be to address the technical issues relating to the CPIB investigation. And the third segment can address questions relating to the public service. Should the queries be sufficiently addressed, it may not be necessary for members to post identical PQs for future sittings. Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, may I have your permission to make two quick factual corrections to what I said just now? First, Mr Tan Kiagan, by 1966, was a former minister, no longer minister, because he had uh, lost in the previous 1963 general elections. Secondly, Mr Wee Toon Boon was Minister of State in the Ministry of Environment and not in MINDEF. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Leader of the Opposition, Mr Pritam Singh. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My, I have two buckets of clarification. One, with regard to the standards of the PAP that Prime Minister spoke of, and second, with regard to the circumstances involving the departure of Speaker, former Speaker Tan Chuan Jin and Cheng Li Hui. So there has been much public disquiet about the transmission of information surrounding Minister Iswaran's arrest by the CPIB, and separately on the affair between Speaker Tan Chuan Jin and MP Cheng Li Hui. This is particularly with regard to what the Prime Minister knew and what the Prime Minister did about it over a period of almost three years before coming clean on the matter. So in this term of government, the government has either been slow to clear the air or been less than upfront and forthright with Singaporeans when it had to deal with potentially embarrassing issues. I will give three examples that capture this point and my clarifications will be contained therein. Firstly, in May this year, the public was not informed forthwith, forthwith that CPIB had been instructed to look into the ride-out road rentals by two ministers. On the 23rd of May, the Prime Minister released a statement stating SM Teo Chi Hien had been appointed to establish whether there had been any wrongdoing in the ride-out road rentals in order to maintain the higher standards of integrity in government. What the Prime Minister did not tell the public but was made known by way of a statement from the Prime Minister's office written in the third person on the 28th of June was that the Prime Minister had directed the CPIB to investigate the Rider Road matter on the 17th of May, a full six days before his 23rd May statement that omitted to mention that he had ordered a CPIB investigation into two of his ministers. The public came to know about the CPIB investigation more than a month later when investigations were completed, with CPIB confirming no criminal offence was disclosed. Second, there is considerable public disquiet about the CPIB releasing a statement on the 12th of July which stated that Minister Iswaran was assisting with investigations while omitting to disclose the fact that Minister Iswaran had been arrested a day before. In a parallel universe, sir, there is a perception that if a Singaporean or a Singaporean company took such a cavalier and breezy approach with critical facts under today's PAP, they can expect to receive a POFMA direction from a PAP minister for perpetuating false statements of facts. Has the Prime Minister inquired with the CPIB why it undertook such a course of action that brought unnecessary attention to the CPIB's processes and by extension even its impartiality involving the release of statements in the public interest? And if he did not, and if he did not would he consider to do so? Thirdly, during COVID-19, the public was belatedly informed by a minister in this House that his senior cabinet colleagues were aware by October 2020 that previous government assurances on Trace Together being solely used for contract tracing were effectively false statements of fact. Misrepresentations had hitherto been made by various government ministers and possibly in this House even before October 2020, and they stood uncorrected for months. 
The PAP government took almost nine months before it disclosed to Singaporeans that the Singapore Police Force sought to collect, trace together data for an investigation in May 2020, even as the PAP continued to assert right through the rest of the year that trace together was only to be used for contact tracing. Unlike as represented by the PM, these are not events that I quote are clustered together, all coming at one go. Instead, they reveal a pattern of behaviour over a period of time of the PAP engaging in half-truths on matters of significant public interest. And this behaviour goes a long way to explain why there is real disquiet among Singaporeans today when the PAP invokes the memory of pioneer generation PAP leaders and talks about trust. So last month, the, P the PM informed this House that he has to set the standards of what is ethical and what is proper and that the PAP government does not need an ethics advisor. Can I invite the Prime Minister to reconsider his position in view of the PAP's pattern of behaviour in this term of government, especially when a potentially embarrassing issue comes up? I would like to suggest to the Prime Minister, in view of the complexity of government and governance today, it would not be embarrassing for the government to consider the appointment of an ethics advisor. So my clarifications on the Cheng Li Hui and Speaker Tan Chuan Jin matter as follows. The Prime Minister said, in comparing the hot mic issue with the inappropriate relationship, that, I quote, in comparison, the relationship was the more serious matter, as he was the Speaker and she was an MP and there should not be a relationship, unquote. My question is, if the Prime Minister knew of the affair in 2020, why were Speaker Tan and Ching Li Hui allowed to be on the same standing select committee of Parliament, namely the House Committee, after GE 2020, when the Prime Minister was already aware of the affair, wouldn't their being on the same committee have resulted in more interactions between them than necessary, or given official reasons to be together? And to this end, has the Prime Minister checked, since he knew of the affair in 2020, how many foreign trips have both Speaker Tan Chuan Jin and Cheng Li have been on at the taxpayer's expense, and was he not aware of them? My next question. Prime Minister stated at the press conference in response to a reporter's question that, I quote, as for comparison with Michael Palmer, I think it depends on the situation of the case, and I said you've got to look at the circumstances, spouses, the family's condition, at how you manage this as sensitively as you can and yet do your duty, and it depends on the person's response as well as the specifics, so I don't think it's possible to make direct comparisons, unquote. I know the PM's reference to such sensitivity and eminently reasonable approach to take with delicate matters. However, the PAP selectively applies these standards, expecting Singaporeans to give the PAP the full benefit of doubt when its MPs foul up, while screaming blue murder when the opposition seek to make the same point. When former WP MP Raisa Khan revealed to the WP leaders that she was a rape victim, sensitivity was not even considered by the Committee of Privileges in accounting for the delay in addressing Raisa's lies to Parliament. And the Prime Minister did not bat an eyelid in giving the Leader of the Opposition a sermon on Confucian ethics, morality and shame, even though at the material time he would have been aware of the affair between Speaker Tan Chuan Jin and MP Cheng Li Hui. Can the Prime Minister please elaborate how the Chan Chuan Jin affair with an MP was different from the circumstances and conditions of former PAP Speaker Michael Palmer's affair with a People's Association member, which Senior Minister Teo Chi Hien then had said had to be dealt with, I quote, decisively. Finally, why was there a need for so much time to plan for the care of Marine, Marine Parade and specifically Kambangan Chai Chi residents? In other cases of resignations of PAP MPs, such as Michael Palmer, President Halima, David Ong and Senior Minister Tarman, nothing close to that length of time was required. Could the Prime Minister detail for us what exact steps were taken between February and July 2023 to arrange for the care of Marine Parade residents? If that was the crux of the issue, then even if the planning for the care of Marine Parade residents was a proper justification for Tan Chuan Jin to remain a Marine Parade MP for five months, why was he not asked to step down as Speaker first and a new Speaker elected? If he had stepped down as Speaker, could he still not have continued as a Marine Parade MP until the arrangements were made? And before I round off, um, uh, Mr. Speaker, just one question, one additional question. How were Tan Chuan Jin and Cheng Li Hui counselled immediately after PM was informed about the affair in 2020? Did 
he personally counsel them? Uh, and how often did he check in on the status of the relationship thereafter? Thank you. Before I ask Prime Minister to respond, I have given Leader of the Opposition some leeway. Uh, at this stage, we should be asking clarifications and uh, not make speeches. And I, I request uh, members going forward to remember that. Prime Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, sir, let me deal first with the question of transmission of information. Uh, the Leader of the Opposition raises three issues, one of which has been extensively debated, in fact, in 2020, 2020 during COVID, and I don't need to go back there again, which is the trace together and whether we should have announced earlier when we discovered that the police were using it for their purposes. I think that has been completely explained, closed. That matter is done. As for CPIB statements, the, state, the CPIB doesn't investigate somebody unless there is a very serious reason to do so. And the CPIB doesn't reveal that investigation generally until it has reason to believe that this investigation has to carry on, that it has to go somewhere. Therefore, in general, CPIB investigations are not in the first instance announced at all. If you had listened to Minister Chan Chun Singh, you would have heard that explained very clearly why, in general, the CPIB doesn't announce any investigations at all. And when I ask the CPIB to investigate, it's my prerogative. I don't have to tell anybody. What is important is that I did conduct an investigation and the investigation results were published. That is what matters. In the case of the 12th July statement, the reason why the CPIB said exactly what they said, if you listen carefully to Minister Chan Chun Singh, that, has been give, that explanation has been given, which was that they had to say what they felt justified in saying at that point for operational reasons and to be fair to the persons involved and the ministers, unless we have strong reason to do otherwise, will go along and we will not go beyond what the CPIB needs and is able to see. So I think in terms of transmission of information, we are pursuing a red herring. We could equally well ask, for example, when did the leader of opposition know about uh, problems in his, in his um, party and what did he do about them? But those are matters which the Workers' Party will have to decide and will have to account to Singaporeans and the PAP we establish our own standards and we establish our own practices. As for the relationship between Tan Chuan Jin and Cheng Li Hui and the questions on the House Committee and foreign trips, I think I will leave that to a leader to answer subsequently. On the difference between this case and the case of uh, Michael Palmer and the PA staff, I think there are two differences. One. In Michael Palmer's case, it involved the PA staff who worked in a team which supported Michael Palmer and other GRA advisors in um, Pasiris Pongol GRC, subsequently Pasiris Pongol GRC and Pongol East SMC. And there is a reporting relationship there. Secondly, I think the, diff the specifics of the extramarital affair matter. As I explained just now, we have to look at how the families respond, what the other circumstances are, and that differs in every case. And I do not wish to go into specifics of how the EMAs are different, but I suffice to say they were different. As for Raisa Khan, uh, that raises many issues, and those issues are now have been exhaustively debated in the Committee of Privileges. The matter, further problems have, uh, were re uh, re recorded and reported by the Committee of Privileges, and the matter has been referred to the police for investigations. So I would leave that to the police to pursue the matter and take it where it may. As for the time, why it took so long, 
I counseled Tan Chuan Jin at the beginning. I saw to it that Cheng Li Hui was also counseled at the beginning. Uh, they both agreed to stop. It didn't happen. I do not wish to go beyond that and to take delve into the ins and outs of how it happened, but suffice it to say, eventually, it came to a break point, and they didn't stop, and they had to go. I could have done it sooner. I should have done it sooner. I have explained that. Marine Parade was a consideration, but all things considered, I should have moved earlier. But the important thing is, we moved and we brought it out, and we were open about it. And, if, and, and when I was asked, I said, yes, I knew sometime after GE20, which is November 2020. I was open about it. If I hadn't said that, nobody would know that. And therefore, we clear the matter, and I think we are count to Singaporeans. Leader of the House. Mr. Speaker, sir, let me address the question which the or clarification which the Leader of the Opposition posed on parliamentary trips or official trips. Since the last general election, uh, former Speaker Mr. Tan Chuan Jin had gone on five official overseas trips um, and three working trips. Working trips would be, for example, um, for the Olympic Games, etc. Of the five official overseas trips, only one was the one where Ms. Cheng Li Hui was present as well. So that was the two, that was the ASEAN Interparliamentary Assembly General Assembly trip to Cambodia in 2022. There were 15 MP delegates in total for this trip. I understand that the Parliament Secretariat had organized since 2020 over eight had organized 18 overseas parliamentary trips, including the IPA Gen uh, General Assembly one in August, the upcoming one in 2023, and 60 MPs have participated in these visits across the years since 2020. So of the 18 visits, Ms. Cheng Li Hui only participated in one overseas trip, and that is the IPA General Assembly one held in Cambodia in 2022, and she did not attend other overseas trips. But she did not attend more overseas trips than other MPs. With regard to her selection for that trip, I understand that the name was put up by the staffing officer uh, and approved. With respect to the House Committee, there are several standing uh, select committees. The names for the composition of the committees are put forward in the case of the PAP representation by myself at, after the last general election. I had sought leader of the opposition's nominations for the opposition MPs because the rules provide that for standing select committees, the proportion or the ratio of majority MPs and opposition MPs should be roughly than the proportion that they are represented in this House. Leader of the opposition, Mr. Pritam Singh. Thank you, Speaker. Just the first point is a point of order. I, I respect what uh, Speaker mentioned about not making extended speeches, but I was merely doing exactly what had transpired about one month ago when uh, PAP MPs made extended speeches, specifically the Prime Minister, in the course of a ministerial statement in response to a question, I believe, from uh, backbencher Denise Pua. So I do seek your indulgence, uh, Speaker. I wasn't going anything beyond what was already carried out by uh, PAP MP in the course of a ministerial statement last month. I understand what Standing Order 23 says. I understand that a debate is not to ensue uh, in the course of, uh, and there cannot be more than clarifications, but uh, nothing special was undertaken by me in the course of me asking questions just now. I just want to put that on record. In terms of uh, Prime Minister's uh, replies, I think some of them still do not go into the details of uh, matters that Singaporeans are actually quite concerned about but uh, I will address some responses which the Prime Minister gave. Uh, first, on Trace Together, that, that this has been extensively debated and so forth, and not particularly so. Uh, there are matters which are still, uh, for which questions still arise. I think the Prime Minister uh, made a, a statement after the, well after the Trace Together issue was debated in Parliament. I think this was in March 
2001, where he apologized uh, and said, let me quote, uh, to be very clear about this matter. Uh, and this was in an SD article, where the, and this was the 14th of March, well after we had discussed uh, Trace Together, and the Prime Minister came out to say, I think we made a mistake. The app was designed for contact tracing, but under the law, the police have powers to ask for information for criminal investigations. We should have said so up front. We did not, and we came out and said so. Uh, I must say this statement came after the storm of Trace Together had passed, and that just reinforces the earlier point that I spoke of. Uh, Minister, uh, Prime Minister spoke about uh, the leader of the opposition, what I did, what I knew. I think I've handled this in the course of my press conference where I took uh, 12 questions, when did the affair start, what information I had secured uh, from the parties concerned, and I believe I answered those fully. If the Prime Minister has specific questions for me, I will try and address them here. Uh, on the point of uh, Raisa Khan, again, I was quite careful not to say anything which would get into the investigation per se, which is still ongoing, but the matter here is about the point the Prime Minister raised about sensitivity. The Prime Minister believes that it is appropriate to respond sensitively given the circumstances at hand. And the point I was making was we were dealing here with someone who said she had been raped. And I did not sense that sensitivity coming from the PAP at the time. And that's the point I was trying to make. Uh, on other matters, I think there will be further questions from Workers' Party MPs. I may come in and uh, follow up with more questions in due course. Thank you, Speaker. Leader of the House, Ms. Indrani. Mr. Speaker, so just a quick point of order. When the Leader of the Opposition uh, spoke just now on a point of order, he said, or he claimed, he was doing no more than the PAP MPs in making extended speeches uh, with respect to the previous matter, which I think was the ride-out matter. Um, I was present for that debate, and I recall quite distinctly the PAP MPs, when seeking clarifications, did not make long speeches. They asked their clarifications. Um, the Leader of the Opposition referred to Ms. Denise Poir. I recall that too. Ms. Denise Poir asked a clarification, and it was directed, obviously, to the Prime Minister's office. The ministerial statement was made by SM2. But she, because it's under Prime Minister's office, the Prime Minister responded to that. When he responded, he's giving a response to the clarification, and he can therefore give a longer answer. He was not making a long speech on a clarification. It's just a point of order, and I wanted to clarify that. Minister for Law, Mr. Shamugam. for a clarification on what he meant, because I'm sure he doesn't mean it, but uh, his statements are misleading on Ms. Raisha Khan. My recollection was that the facts are as follows, and we need to be very clear on what the facts are when we speak in this House. There was a committee of privileges. Mr. Singh gave evidence. My recollection, and he will correct me if I'm wrong, there are others here who were in that committee, was that the committee was very sensitive about not describing what exactly happened to Ms. Khan. But it was Mr. Singh who insisted that the word rape ought to be mentioned. I hope he can clarify and confirm that. Otherwise, we can check the record. So when someone stands up here and says, we want to be sensitive, I think we need to look back at what each one did. The word rape, my recollection, was insisted upon by Mr. Singh. So, so much for sensitivity. Second, what was the point in relation to Ms. Khan? It was that in August, Mr. Singh, Ms. Sylvia Lim, and Mr. Manap were told by her that she had lied in Parliament. This is not about rape. This is not about sexual assault. This is about her lying in Parliament. She says Mr. Singh told her to take it to a grave. 
It was a serious matter lying in Parliament, serious enough for her to be out of Parliament. September came, October came, she repeated the lie in front of Mr. Singh, and no correction. That was the issue. And thereafter, what happened? Mr. Singh, Ms. Lim, and Mr. Manap sat on a disciplinary panel to decide why Ms. Khan didn't tell the truth and sacked her. But if she was telling the truth that she had told them, which they admit they had been told, well, the public can judge for themselves. But I think we should be very careful about putting out the facts. I believe when the Prime Minister said, and he will speak for himself, about sensitivity, it's about how it affects everyone. And I think if we had applied the same degree of sensitivity, no one would have insisted on recording that Ms. Khan was raped. Leader of the Opposition, Mr. Pritam Singh. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Let me bring this matter and address, let me address uh, this, the Minister of Law's points, which frankly uh, don't really add much to this debate. But what I would say, and this is what I said in my first comment to the Prime Minister was, it is about the selective standard that is applied. It is normal for the PAP to say, look, be sensitive when a matter of this nature comes up. My point was, and in referencing the word rape, my point was, this was how serious the matter was for us as leaders to think about. And I believe I was asked at the COP, why didn't you respond earlier? Why didn't you react earlier? And I said, I should have reacted earlier. But because I had an MP who had made some, such a serious point about of something of a personal nature, I also needed to make sure that she had addressed the matter with her parents. Because in the words of the Prime Minister, you have to look at the circumstances, spouses and the family's conditions. So I think the Minister of Law is missing the point here. It wasn't an insistence because of a lack of sensitivity vis-a-vis -vis the word rape. That wasn't it. It was the circumstances we were in to make a decision in double quick time on what to do going forward. I hope that clarifies the matter. Uh, I'm not sure what the second clarification was from the law minister. If he can repeat it, I will deal with it. Well, I repeat both. On the first, I think the leader has missed the point. I believe the committee suggested that we don't need to expressly talk about rape. And Mr. Singh insisted on talking about rape. Not only that, he insisted on bringing in her mental condition. I think most observers felt a considerable degree of disquiet at this, that attacking a young lady on the basis of her mental condition and also insisting on putting on record that she had been raped. I think everyone could see why that was done. The second point was this. The serious issue was lying in Parliament and then lying again. And that had nothing to do with her sexual assault. She could have come up and said, I didn't tell the truth. And her seniors in the party could have advised her. That's a matter COP has gone into extensively. And it's a matter, some of it is now the subject of investigations. That's the point I'm making. Um, members, I just want to remind everyone uh, that today's ministerial statement concerns Minister Isoran and the resignations of former Speaker and a PAP MP. And I, again, let me just read out Standing Order 23 for everyone's benefit.
A statement may be made by a minister in parliament on a matter of public importance. Members may seek clarification on the statement, but no debate, no debate shall be allowed thereon. Leader of the Opposition, Mr. Pritam Singh. Thank you, Speaker. Timely intervention, I must say. Uh, on, I think on the first point, uh, I have stated the difference of opinion I have with the Minister of Law with regard to uh, the use of the word and the reason why the word was important in the context of what the COP were investigating. On the second point about mental illness, uh, this is a question of fact. This was communicated to us. We recorded it in our notes when she shared her condition, and I felt it was an important point for the COP to consider. It wasn't a case of putting someone with such an issue out to dry, as the minister is very enthusiastic uh, to portray. Uh, the second clarification about lying in parliament, I think I dealt with this. Uh, it was really of why I didn't stand up when she repeated the lie. I had no confirmation as to whether she had dealt with the matter of her rape with her parents. And I wasn't going to stand up and call her out and say, no, these are the reasons why that lie had to be said. And I think I made that apparent to the COP. Dr. Vivian Balakrishnan, you wanted to make a clarification? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just wanted to address Mr. Pritam Singh's suggestion that we had been somehow being tardy or reticent with information with respect to Trace Together. Now, I don't want this to become a whole repeat of an extended discussion which we had on this matter. Mr. Singh will remember this. Uh, we had this extended discussion in early 2021. But just to refresh your memory, Trace Together is a system that temporarily collected Bluetooth proximity data without GPS coordinates, without movement data, and the data is expunged after 25 days. When I first was involved with the design of the system, it was purely for the purposes of contact tracing, dealing with a clear and present danger that COVID-19 presented to our population. I made a statement, I think it was in June 2020, which omitted four important words. The four missing words, which I said before, was subject to prevailing legislation. What I had not known when I made the assurance that the data would not be available to law enforcement agencies, was that Section 20 of the CPC in fact applied to trace together data, as it does to all other information which a person may have access to, which the police may need for the purposes of investigation. Anyway, I made that statement in ignorance of the prevailing legislation and I omitted those four words in June 2020. Around about, I believe, near the end of October 2020, a member of the public wrote to me and said, are you sure? Please check. So I said, thank you. And I did get my staff to check. So that was already into November. And when my staff in the Smart Nation office then told me, actually, Section 20 of the CPC may be relevant, that's when you will recall I sat in this house right from this stand. I had many sleepless nights deciding what do we do about this. Do we make legislative changes or do we instruct the police or could we even instruct the police to proscribe their access to this data, although, legally speaking, they had. So there was sleepless nights on my part, intense discussions internally between multiple agencies on part of the government in November 2020. 
And my staff will also recall, I told them, whatever it is, when we finish this internal review, we will come back here and we will come clean in my usual fashion and explain the situation. We didn't have a sitting in December, but I believe it was Mr. Christopher de Souza who filed a question. I think it was in December 2020. And on the 4th of January 2021, um, the answer was answered, I believe, by the MOS of Home Affairs, Desmond Tan. On the 5th of January, I added further clarifications. And I also indicated, I think a few days after that, that we will come back to Parliament in February 2021 with legislative changes to circumscribe the access by law enforcement agencies into trace to get the data. Now, I've taken some pains, and I'm sorry to take up the time, but I hope, Mr. Singh, you will realize that I have never deliberately engaged in any obfuscation, prevarication, or delay. I have at all times acted in good faith. I have tried to make sure that in design, in execution, and in coordination of a complex matter in an emergency, I have been transparent and forthright with the people, and I object to your characterization and use of an old debate which was settled in Parliament to suggest that there is a pattern of delay, prevarication, and obfuscation. I object to that characterization. Mr. Pritam Singh. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I note. Uh, Minister Vivian's objection. Let me just uh, share some details about what happened in January and February in this House in the course of that debate. NCMP Leong Man Wai had asked the Minister, when did you discover that your statement was going to be affected by the CPC? The Minister did not answer that question. But when, when, when was the first? This was in January. And the point here is there were Ministers who were in this House who knew that actually they were already in receipt of knowledge in October 2020 about the fact that Trace Together applied to the CPC. The Minister admitted that. But that was a month later in February, if I recall, February 2021, where the Minister said, and let me pull out the hands up, I may just have a bit of it here, when it was checked uh, at the end of October, this is Minister Vivian's words, I was asked basically, what did I spend November doing, double-checking the legislation, and then having among sleepless nights and conversations, do we carve it out, how do we do it? So that occupied us in November. That's what you said. I'm not disputing that. What I'm saying is that there is a significant delay in time before questions are asked of the government. Uh, when did, was Minister Vivian the only one looking at Trace Together and the applicability of Trace Together in May of 2020? I think Minister Shanmugam had a discussion with a mayor in, uh, what is it, the mayor of New York, I believe, talking about privacy concerns, trace together concerns. And my point is, did no one in the government consider the applicability of Section 20 to the CPC? We don't know that. But what we do know is that the Prime Minister then apologized, not in January, not in February, not in October, November or December, but in March, after we had dealt with the issue, and that's my point. There's significant delay. Minister Vivian Balakrishnan. Mr Singh, is there really a delay? Look at that timeline which you, I have said and you have just repeated. First of all, I take responsibility. I'm in charge. I was in charge of the programme. I became aware at the end of, November, end of, no, I was asked the question by a member of public, not even in this house, end of October. I spent November double-checking the facts, coordinating, examining the policy op options, discussing with my colleagues. And I also told my staff, we will clear all this, whichever way it falls. A question is asked by Mr. Christopher de Souza in December. Unfortunately, we didn't sit in December. Early January, we answered it. 
I've added further clarifications. I then embarked on the process. In fact, we had to get a certificate of urgency for legislative changes. In February, we had this debate. I don't think I delayed or obfuscated. And at all times, you know, I've always been upfront and clean. Mr. Leong knows that as well. I mean, I've been here long enough. People know the way I operate. So that's why I'm objecting to your insinuation that there's any undue delay or any attempt at obfuscation or lack of transparency. That's not the way we do it. Minister Shamugam, you have a clarification? To pull up what the committee said, since Mr. Singh has made reference to it, I think we should have on record what exactly happened. This is the Committee of Privileges record, uh, I think 7294. This is Mr. Singh saying, this is where I think circumstances in my judgment were of such a nature that I was prepared to give the member time in view of her again. I repeat what you said earlier. I used the word and he said rape, but the committee in its record changed it to sexual assault and put it in square brackets. Earlier, because this was the word Ms. Raisha Khan used when she described herself, but if chair and the committee would want me to use sexual assault, I'm happy to use that word. I just used that word meaning rape because that was a word Raisha Khan used. Mr. Edwin Tong says, yes, I would prefer not. We don't need to go into any other details unless they are strictly necessary. Mr. Singh says, I don't really know the details. Chairman says, I'm quite happy if you can just use sexual assault. Mr. Singh then says, OK, I will use sexual assault. Just to remember that on record, that's what Ms. Khan told us, that she was raped when she was 18. Uh, then on the other point, on mental health, this is what the COP report says. In the course of their testimony before the committee, Mr. Singh, Ms. Lim, and Mr. Faisal made some assertions about Ms. Khan's mental condition. Mr. Singh, in particular, emphasized this. He said that Ms. Khan might be suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder and disassociation. Mr. Singh said that on 4 October, when he met Ms. Khan in the LO office, she was in a dazed state, suggesting that she was somewhat disoriented. Ms. Lim also gave the evidence that at the DP hearing on 29 November, Ms. Khan explained that the anecdote was not in the first draft because she was disassociated and did not know who, what she was doing. Ms. Lim also said that she was worried because as far as she and senior WP leaders could understand, Ms. Khan was doing things without thinking. Mr. Singh also said that the statement in Ms. Khan's 8 August WhatsApp message, they have agreed that the best thing to do is to take the information to the grave, was a lie. When Mr. Singh was asked why Ms. Khan would lie about this, Mr. Singh said that Ms. Khan had told the DP on 29 November that she suffered from disassociation. He said that Ms. Khan may have a problem. His position was that Ms. Khan could be predisposed to lying because she had mental health issues. Mr. Singh asked the committee to consider asking Ms. Khan to go for a psychologist, psychological assessment. When Mr. Singh was asked to explain his earlier evidence, there was nothing unusual about Ms. Khan's performance as an MP between August and September, which was in contrast to his evidence that she could be suffering from disassociation. Mr. Singh confirmed again that there was nothing out of the ordinary about Ms. Khan's performance as an MP at the material time. Ms. Khan was given an opportunity to respond to the assertions made by the three senior WP leaders regarding her mental health. Ms. Khan said it was extremely out of line for Mr. Singh and Mr. Lim to have used mental illness as a means to discredit her. Mr. Singh had tried to paint a picture of her as someone who was mentally unstable when she was of sound mind. In addition, Ms. Khan had told the DP on 29 November that while her therapist had said that she might have symptoms of PTSD, she clarified that this was not something she was going through. Mental health issues have to be approached with sensitivity. She expressed concern that using a person's mental health to discredit them, as Mr. Singh and Ms. Lim had done, would set back the movement to progress mental health awareness and support. 
Attributing such labels on people would discourage them from asking for help when they needed it. And so the, on the record is also expert testimony that Ms. Khan didn't have those issues. Third point is Mr. Singh suggesting, the leader of the opposition, that I knew, because let's not make innuendos, that I knew of Mr. Vivian Balakrishnan's statement and deliberately kept quiet. Um, before I ask the leader of the opposition, I want to again remind members of today's ministerial statement. And there were, there are 12 MPs who had filed PQs on this matter. I would like to give all these 12 MPs, if they wish to seek clarifications, the opportunity to do so. Leader of the opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. First, on the point that uh, Minister Shanmugam raised on item 7294 that is my direct testimony and it doesn't contradict anything that i've said here today or make the point that the minister is trying to suggest that's the first issue second issue on the mental health point he is referring not to my words or my testimony in the committee but how the committee of privileges characterized in its report its interpretation of what had happened vis-a-vis -vis what miss khan has said but wouldn't the COP want to know all the facts of the matter? In fact, in the documents that I submitted to the COP, it was clearly stated in my notes that this is what Raisa Khan told us. And so I was merely relaying that to the committee to then, as he, as he is doing now, make an inductive leap and characterize that this is now an attack on all people of, who are suffering from mental health issues and that we're going for the juggler here. I think that's really, really not proper. I don't think you have any basis to say that. The final point about innuendo and suggestions, my question to the minister is this. Did the minister or anybody in MHA ring the bell in government to say, actually, Section 20 of the CPC applies for Trace Together well before October 2020? I will now draw, uh, request members now, those who have filed PQs earlier on this matter, if they have clarifications, to raise them. Dr. Tan Wu Ming. I thank Mr. Speaker. I seek a bit of brief indulgence from Speaker. I file all three of my oral questions on the CPIB case. And I hope Speaker will allow me to just ask three clarifications to the Prime Minister. Sir, it's been said that there are decades when nothing happens, and then there are weeks where decades happen. May I ask the Prime Minister three clarifications? Firstly, on the timeline of CPIB's disclosures, in hindsight, would it have been foreseeable that Hotel Properties Limited HPL would make a disclosure publicly that their managing director had been subject to a notice of arrest and asked to provide information on his interactions with Minister Iswaran. And in hindsight, would that have possibly shaped CPIB's assessment of whether to disclose up front that the minister had himself been arrested? rather than stating in the initial press release that he was assisting with investigations. That's my first clarification. My second clarification, without prejudging the issues, pertains to the Public Service Division. In the event that CPIB makes adverse findings against a particular public officer in the public service, will that public officer's previous official decisions be subject to retrospective review to ensure that there has not been any inappropriate influence swaying the decision. Thirdly, some may call recent events the reputational crisis of a generation for Singapore. Can the Prime Minister and Government assure us and our residents that every effort will be made to repair the damage to Singapore's reputation so that people 
businesses, others around the world will know that Singapore is going to settle the matter and put things right. Because if we become just another ordinary country, Singapore will be finished. Thank you. Minister, um, Minister Chan Chun Singh. Mr. Speaker, sir, thank you. I will answer on behalf of the Prime Minister as this relates to the CPIB technical issues, which I thought we will address in the second bucket of questions. The short answers to Mr. Tan Wu Ming's questions are as follows. Number one, would CPIB have reviewed more information earlier than what was it has done? As I have explained, what CPIB reviewed from the 12th to the subsequent days is all dependent on its operational considerations to preserve the integrity of evidence, the confidentiality of the investigations, and also not to adversely affect the progress of the investigation. So what CPIB review at any point in time is CPIB's operational decisions, and that has nothing to do with HPL's declaration or otherwise. Second, will CPIB, or for that matter, any law enforcement agencies take a retrospective review of all decisions made by any officers being investigated. That is a decision entirely dependent on the investigations required by the respective law enforcement agencies, including CBIB. Third, on Mr Tan Wu Ming's characterisation that this is a reputational crisis, as Prime Minister said, yes, we have taken a hit, but I have always believed this. Circumstances don't define us. Our responses to circumstances define us and how we respond to circumstances will define us and we have every determination that the way we handle this must restore confidence by the Singapore public and our international partners. Mr Leong Manboy. Sir, I think the uh, um, um, debate on the Oh, not debate, sorry. The, the clarification uh, on this uh, uh, Minister Yisaran case, a lot depends on what is the, the exact date of arrest. There's some confusion, and I think the public would also like to know. Uh, we did read somewhere from some uh, uh, mainstream media that it was 11 July, but from what, the minister, from what Minister Chan said just now, he seems to give the impression that the... Uh, Former arrest was not taken until after 12th of July. Maybe we can clarify. Can I clarify the point first? Yeah. Minister Chan. Mr. Speaker, sir, I have. Uh, I, I wish not to repeat what I have said in the statement. On the 12th of July, Mr. Minister Iswaran was asked to assist in investigations and during the. Uh, sir, sorry, 11th of July. Uh, Mr. Iswaran was asked, 11th of July, Minister Iswaran was asked to assist in the investigation. And as the investigation progressed, CPIB made the relevant judgment, operational judgments on what to review. Mr. Louis Chua. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Just two clarifications. Can I, firstly, can I confirm that even though the CPIB has functional independence in its operations, which I think Minister Chan said, it is obligated to seek PM's concurrence to initiate formal investigations into ministers. And if this is the case, which are the classes of people or, or public officers where the PM's concurrence is required and under which section of the Prevention of Corruption Act is this specified? And secondly, in related to that, Based on the provisions in the current statutes, should the PM and President both refuse to give concurrence to the CPIB, does it mean that the CPIB cannot commence formal investigations into certain classes of people? Thank you. Minister Chan. Uh, Mr Speaker, sir, as I have mentioned, CPIB six PM's concurrence to open up investigation because it involves a standing Cabinet Minister, has the PM ever denied CPIB permission to conduct any investigation throughout its history? The answer is no. And the second answer to Mr. Louis Chua's question is that 
What if the PM and the President don't concur? P CPIB has the right to proceed with his investigation. Ms. He Tengru. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Two uh, clarifications from me. First, to follow on on the point about uh, the PM's concurrence being sought, um, I was just wondering that, you know, in the event that uh, in an active investigation into a minister, for example, um, if the CPIB then decides to, to pass it on to the public prosecutor who then decides to proceed, i.e., you know, to, to, to charge the individual being investigated, would the PM's concurrence then also be uh, required? I know this is not currently required under the Prevention of Corruption Act, but I'm just wondering, given that, you know, uh, we have a slightly different, um, I guess, approach uh, with uh, the commencement of investigations, uh, I'm just wondering whether this will also be the case. And then secondly, um, I wanted to know also that um, CPI, CPIB apprised the PM or other political office holders, cabinet ministers, about the facts relating to the active investigation into Minister Warren and um, you know, whether or not uh, any, any uh, information or evidence was given, and whether this was used in deciding whether or not to place uh, Minister Eswaran on interdictum. Thank you. Minister Chan. Mr. Speaker, sir, uh, let me clarify just one thing just now. Uh, what I say may not be entirely accurate. I will check that, and I'll get back to the House as to the hypothetical situation which has not happened whereby the PM, and the, Prime Minister, uh, the PM and the President didn't give permission for CBIB to proceed. I withdraw that. I will check that and I'll get back to the House. On, Mr., uh, on Ms. Herting's rules uh, reply, uh, sorry, on your question, the question is that once the investigation has started, CPIB will submit its report to the AGC and it will be taken to its logical conclusion. There's no requirement for subsequent approval. Mr. Saktiandi, Supa. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have two supplementary questions. First is on the uh, matter of principle. Uh, in regards to my PQ, I actually asked about the guidelines, transparent guidelines for mandatory disclosures or announcements when a minister is personally implicated. I'm concerned first as a matter of principle because the Minister of Public uh, POH is involved uh, because also in the context and environment that we are possibly open to leaks and social media age that we are in, uh, what does that uh, mean in that sort of context? Uh, does it really mean that we actually have to actually have a different sort of set of rules or transparent guidelines when the POH or minister is involved? My second SQ speaker is in regards to PM's uh, point just now about Mr. Iswaran's interdiction uh, from duty. Um, and yet, uh, PM mentioned that he will still be getting $8,500 per month. Uh, can PM explain um, the, the, the reasoning behind 8,500 uh, in, in sort of normal circumstances, you would expect someone with um, interdiction from duty and no role uh, or duties that undertaken for the month uh, would actually be taking po possibly absence of leave from duty uh, rather than uh, possibly getting the 8,500 per month. Um, I hope PM can help answer the question. Thank you. Prime Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, sir, uh, guidelines on disclosures involving ministers, basically we have to judge the situation. In this case, CPIB judged, and I supported them, that they are going to be interviewing a minister. Uh, they are going to be interviewing other people. Word will go around town. It's untenable for us to say we have no comment. And therefore, they put out a statement that they are interviewing the ministers, a minister. There have been, and it is not the previous president. Those of you who are old enough to remember, I don't think there's anybody else in the House except me who was here when Mr. Te Chiang Wan was investigated. And none of that was announced. Because you don't know at first when you interview him whether or not there is something there. And if you interview him, if you announce that he's being interviewed, Minister for National Development, and then it turns out there's nothing there, and you come out three days later and say, Minister for National Development is innocent, I think you're going to cause great consternation, and in the end of that, 
his reputation will be damaged undeservedly. But you investigate him first. If it turns out there is something there, at some point you cross a threshold and it is necessary to make an announcement. In this case, CPIB judged that the threshold to say that they are talking to Mr. Iswaran was there right from the beginning, because they were going to call in other people, including Mr. Ong Beng Singh, HPL. Therefore, it was not possible for this thing to be kept quiet, and it had to be stated up front. But would they know where, how, where the investigation will lead? At that point, no. Three days later, after interviewing different people and establishing various facts, they make a fresh assessment at that point. They are comfortable to say that the minister was arrested and bailed because the situation is different. So these are operational judgments which our law enforcement agencies have got to make. All the law enforcement agencies, whether it's CNB, whether it's the police, whether it's CPIB, and they do this all the time. And in this case, CPIB did it. And did they know that three days later, Mr. Ong Beng Singh would issue, uh, HPL would issue such a statement? I think they expected that, Mr., that HPL would have to issue such a statement because there is a regulatory requirement by the SGX. I don't think they would know what Mr. Ong Beng Singh would say, and it would depend what had transpired during the three days before Mr. Ong put out that statement. So. I think we are reading a lot into very little. First of all, nobody knew that Mr. Iswaran might or might not have been doing something wrong. CPIB found out. Nobody tipped them off. Nobody blew a whistle. Nobody raised a public scandal. No PQ in Parliament, not even from the Workers' Party. But CPIB found out, and they told me, and they decided to investigate the matter. And they proceeded. It reached a point where they needed to interview the minister. And then they came to tell me and say, can I have your concurrence? Because CPIB reports to somebody. It has to report to somebody. It can't report to God. So who does it report to? Now, that's a very interesting question. Once upon a time, we had an SAF officer who went overseas on a course. He went to a Commonwealth country. And the course mate asked him, how do you keep your system clean in Singapore of corruption? This is a country which grapples with this problem. And he gave the, uh, explained how we do it, you know, we have the CPIB, it was zealous, it has a fearsome reputation, you go and limkopi, you know what will happen. And his course mate asked him, whom does the CPIB report to? So he thought this was an organisational question. So he said, well, you know, it's independent, it's got its own chain of command, it reports to the Prime Minister. And his colleague looked at him again and says, who does the CPIB report to? Why did he ask that question? Because the question at the root of it is the age-old problem. Who is to judge the people who judge the people who judge the judges? Who is in charge? Somebody has to be in charge. And in Singapore, the Prime Minister is in charge. And if he is corrupt, you are sunk. Beyond that, we decided to put in an extra safeguard. And that is, if the Prime Minister directs the CPIB, you don't do that. CPIB can go to the President and say, Prime Minister has refused me consent, do you concur? And if the President says yes, then the Director CPIB can proceed. If the President agrees with the Prime Minister that the Director CPIB does not have a case or has gone rogue, or is doing something ill-founded and says no, well, that's how two keys work. And therefore, the matter stops there. Is it guaranteed? No, because the Prime Minister may be corrupt, the President may be mistaken, but it's as best it is possible to contrive a system with human beings which will work, provided you put honest people in charge. 
That's how the system is supposed to work in Singapore. Now, as for the interdiction and why it's $8,500 per month, we considered this carefully. We are not the first. It's unusual for a Prime Minister to have to do this to a minister. But we are not the first organization to confront this problem of a person under suspicion being investigated. And what do you do with him while he's being investigated before he's either cleared or charged and convicted? You have to have some arrangement. Can you leave him at work? Well, that depends. In the case of the ride-out bungalows, I had no doubt I could leave the ministers at work. I did not believe that they were guilty, neither did any evidence come up during the process of the investigation that they were. In fact, the investigation cleared them. If the investigation had surfaced something which looked questionable, I would have been told, and I would have made a decision whether they needed to be interdicted and uh, put on leave of absence. In the case of Mr. Iswaran, by the time formal investigations began on the 11th of July, the CPIB had been working on this case since at least May. So they had some basis to come to some conclusion, and I had to decide what to do with a minister who is being investigated for what could be quite a serious matter, which is a possible corruption offence. That's why CPIB is investigating it. And what do I do? Because I don't have a precedent, I don't have a norm, I look at what the civil service does as a guideline. Their, their situation is different, but here you have a, an officer who is under suspicion, who is be under investigation. He has not been convicted. A presumption of innocence applies. He is innocent until proven guilty. So I could technically have said, well, he presumed innocent, he goes on leave, full pay, until the matter is cleared. I could also have said there's a cloud. I straight away don't want anybody with a cloud. You are out. I think that would have been unjust because he has not been charged. A case has not been. If there's a case, the case has not been heard. He's not been found guilty or acquitted or whatever. You cannot. I cannot prejudge a case based on an incomplete investigation started. Recently, or a partial investigation just entered into the formal phase. So what is a fair thing to do? And the civil service, their practice is in such situations, you get interdicted, you're put on half pay, subject to a ceiling and a floor, but you are there until the matter is disposed of. If you are, at the end of it, innocent, if nothing is there, your back pay is reinstated to you and made good. If at later on, in fact, you're found guilty, well, at that point, your pay will stop completely and other consequences will follow. And I think that is a reasonable, reasonable model to follow, and that is a basis on which I decided that Mr. Iswaran would be interdicted and that he would be paid $8,500 per month instead of his normal salary. And he was told, acknowledged, and that was done. I think that's the proper way to do things. Mr. Jero Giam. Thank you, Mr. S <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Mr. Speaker, the PM said just now that CPIB informed him on 29th May 2023 that it came across information concerning Minister Iswaran that merited investigation. After receipt of this information, did the PM allow Minister Iswaran to continue his normal duties as Minister for Transport and MP for West Coast GRC? Uh, it appears that the investigation on this case involving Minister Iswaran started before, sometime before July when the formal investigation was started. This formal investigation was started in July. Can I ask what is the difference between an investigation and a formal investigation by CPIB and when is this threshold crossed? And uh, concerning the the uh, vacation of the, of the seat of the former speaker. Can I ask the PM, did the parliamentary seat of the former speaker become vacant in February 2023 when he offered his resignation to the Prime Minister and the, and the Prime Minister accepted his resignation? 
And lastly, the Speaker of Parliament is supposed to be impartial towards all MPs. Can I ask the PM, did a conflict of interest occur due to the extramarital affair between the former Speaker and an MP? And, and this, where this information was not revealed to the House earlier on. And lastly, sorry, um, I think Mr. Minister Chan did not answer the Part D of my question 14, which was how many declarations of meals were received, uh, were made in the past year, and what was the total value of these declarations? Thank you. Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, sir, after the 29th of May, after when CPIB informed me that they were looking into Mr. Iswaran's matter, he continued his duties, but I was aware of the issue. I alerted his ministers, particularly in MTI, and uh, we had in mind that this matter was in the background, so that if any issues came up which needed to be decided involving Iswaran, we would know that there was this complication which we would have to think about. But we did not, I did not have a basis yet to suspend him. What is the difference between an informal in, a quiet investigation and a formal investigation? In a quiet investigation, the CPIB doesn't exercise all of its powers. For example, it doesn't arrest people and formally interview them. It makes inquiries, it asks for information, but it has not formally exercised its powers and to arrest a person and to compel him to re answer their questions under the Prevention of Corruption Act. Because under the Prevention of Corruption Act, if you answer a CPI the CPIB and give the CPIB a false answer, that's a crime. It's like being on oath. So when you go into a formal investigation, that a transition point is passed. And the reason they needed to go into a formal investigation is because they had reached a point where they had to interview the principal parties who were involved, namely Mr. Iswaran, and they also had to interview several other people, including Mr. Ong Beng Singh, and therefore they needed to launch a formal process at that point. As for Mr. Tan Juan Jin's seat in February, no, it did not become vacant in February. He offered to resign. I accepted. That was my decision taken strategically. The actual implementation was to come at a time convenient to me. The formal process to resign, he would have had to write to the Deputy Speaker, and that's legally done. And that was done when eventually he did resign, I think, on the 17th of July. Thirdly, on the Speaker being impartial was a conflict of interest. I addressed this in my main uh, ministerial statement just now and explained why. This is a situation where it was improper, a speaker having an affair with an MP. But therefore, it's not a matter where you can stop having the affair and the carry on as if nothing happened. But neither is it a situation where the speaker is in a position of command or supervisory responsibility over the MP. The speaker presides, yes, but the Speaker is not the MP's boss. The Speaker is, does not decide the MP's bonus. The Speaker does not decide the MP's postings. Does not assign work to the MPs. So therefore, you are in a situation where it's awkward, but it is not something which must be stopped immediately. And that's why I ask you to think, have a thought experiment. Would it have been okay if the Speaker is married to an MP? It can easily happen. We've had ministers who have been married to an M a minister married to an MP, both serving simultaneously in the House. Nothing wrong. Speaker and an MP serving in the House, is there anything wrong? I don't think so. Everybody will know it. Speaker will have to be extra careful and uh, make sure that he will bend over backwards not to be seen to be favouring his wife or husband or her husband. But if it is an extramarital affair, I think that's different. It puts everybody else on edge in an awkward position, MPs as well as staff. And in Singapore's context, people look at it and say, this will not pass muster. So therefore, that is a situ situation you're in. It's not a question of my making a 
conflict of interest decision where I'm making a decision which financially benefits me, but it's a situation where I have where a personal relationship crosses with a public relationship, and in this case is an extramarital personal relationship, and that makes it difficult. Ms. Joan Pereira. Thank you, oh, sorry, let, uh, let Minister Chan make the response first. Mr. Speaker, sir, the simple answer to Mr. Gerard Skiam's fourth question is that we don't track such declarations and add them up, but if there's a declaration that warrants uh, attention by the Permanent Secretary or the Head of Agency, they will take the actions necessary. Ms. Joan Pereira. Thank you, Speaker. Um, I would like to ask, um, given the current speculation among the public regarding the nature of the CPIB investigations into Minister Iswaran and HPL, whether there is currently any uncertainty or lack of clarity in the existing code of conduct that should be addressed to avoid causing our public servants and even our political office holders to become overly fearful and potentially impeding the discharge of their normal duties. Thank you. Minister Chan. Mr. Speaker, sir, I think I'll reiterate two points. First, the code of conduct, any code of conduct, will lay out the broad principles and the guidelines for people to follow. But that in itself must be complemented by good people who must abide by the spirit of the rules and not just the letter of the rule. And this is how we run our system. Three things. We need good rules. We need good people. If any of these things fail, we must have the third limb, which is that we must have a system to make sure that we put things right. So in setting out any rules of code of conduct, we are mindful that the rules must be clear, but yet at the same time, not so prescriptive till it becomes paralyzing for the system to work. But that's only the first step. The second step is very important, is to have good people with good values that can interpret the rules, abide by the rules and the spirit of the rule. And if something goes wrong, we must have a system to put it right. Mr. Yip Hong Wing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question uh, is to Minister Chan, and it pertains to my parliamentary question 11. Um, how, how does uh, the public service intend to strengthen its whistleblowing policies and promote better awareness of these uh, policies and that civil servants are protected by non-retaliation policies that are in place. Thank you. Minister Chan. Mr. Speaker, sir, I think in my answer, I have laid out the current rules that the public service adopts in terms of uh, whistleblowing and also the non-retaliation policy, so I will not repeat that. And I will just add that the public service will continue to make sure that our rules are relevant and current to the circumstances and needs of the time. And we'll continue to do this regularly to make sure that our rules are updated and our people are kept updated and that they have the confidence to do what is right. Ms. Hazel Poor. I have two clarifications. First, to revisit the point, uh, uh, the question about why is um, Minister Iswaran's leave of absence not no pay leave? Um, in the case, uh, the Prime Minister mentioned that in the civil service, the practice is to put them on half pay. Um, I can understand the rationale for that uh, in the case of low wage earners who may need a regular monthly income in order to survive. But I think that hardly applies in the case of a uh, minister. And um, we, um, for $8,500 a month, that might be small change to some, but many Singaporeans have to work very hard for much less than that. Um, secondly, um, about protection for civil servants, um, uh, although um, a minister said that uh, there's a non-retaliation clause, uh, can, can the minister elaborate on uh, what that non-retaliation clause uh, uh, comprises or if not to let me know where I can find further information on that? Thank you. Minister Chan. 
Mr. Speaker, sir, on the second question, I have explained the protection of the civil servants in terms of the non-retaliation laws, which basically say this, if anybody thinks that they have a case, they report it in good faith, and even if subsequently the so-called accused or alleged accused is found to be innocent, there will be no retaliation against the person who made the initial report. That is the spirit of the non-retaliation law and is in our public service rules. Ms. Hani So. Sorry, Sorry uh, Mr. Speaker, to respond to Ms. Pua on why not no pay leave is my judgment to make. The civil service works it one way. Their basis is if you have been convicted, then you are on zero pay and other consequences will follow. Here, I have to be fair to the minister involved as well as do the right thing by the government and the taxpayer. He is under investigation. It is not a minor matter. He has not been convicted. He has not even been charged. Is it fair for me to say your pay goes to zero? I think it is not. What is fair? Well, I looked at the civil service. Civil service says half pay subject to minimum and ceiling. Their ceiling is about here too. So I decided on this number, $8,500, because it's much less than half pay. So I think we have to go on principles rather than whatever we do. Anything you can do, I can do stronger. I think that would not be a wise approach to take. Ms. Haini So. Thank you, Speaker. Um, this question is in relation to Minister Chan's uh, earlier comment in relation to CPIB being functionally independent. My clarification is what oversight is actually exercised over the CPIB and whether the CPIB's investigation methods are being audited on a regular basis to ensure impartiality and parity of treatments, regardless of the identity of the subject of the investigations. Minister Chan. Mr. Speaker, sir, on the second point about the quality of uh, CPIB's investigations, all our law enforcement agencies learn from each other. They also learn from best practices from other parts of the world to make sure that our systems are up to mark. But the most significant test of whether our investigations are up to mark is really this that when CPIB or any of our law enforcement agencies submit their case to the AGCs and it goes to the courts, are our investigations method up to the mark? Because if they are not up to the mark, they will be rejected by AGC and the courts. So the final arbiter, if you like, of the quality of the work that our law enforcement agencies do is actually with our courts. Mr. Dennis Tan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I'd like to seek some clarifications from Prime Minister. Uh, earlier, the Prime Minister said that uh, sometime around after the 29th of May, the, um, um, the, minister, um, the Prime Minister had informed someone in the MTI. Um, and may I know what is the purpose of this communication? For example, um, who in MTI uh, was informed of this? And uh, what was the purpose of this communication? For example, whether any precautionary measure were carried out. My second clarification for the Prime Minister. Prime Minister mentioned about the interdiction and the how he arrived at a pay of 7,500. Just a quick clarification. Is this in lieu of both ministers' pay and MPs' allowance? And finally, um, Mr. Speaker, I believe that Minister Chan has not answered the second question of uh, my colleague, the Honourable Ms. Herting Ru. Thank you. Speaker, sir, I don't think it was a very difficult question to figure out that when I spoke to MTI, I spoke to the Minister. Because Mr. Gan Kim Yong is a Minister for Trade and Industry. Mr. Iswaran is a Minister who has a role in MTI. He's overseeing various matters to do with trade, as well as uh, projects like the F1, and I thought it was important that the Minister for MTI knows that there is an investigation going on concerning Mr. Iswaran so that he knows how to deal with the issue until the investigation has reached the point. And 
The matter is public. It's necessary. So that's quite clear. On the MP's allowance, it has not been interdicted. The MP's allowance is different from the pay. It's not the, at the discretion of the Prime Minister. It's, if you want to do that, the Parliament has to move a motion to interdict the MP as an MP, and Parliament has not done that. And neither in previous cases has Parliament done that. What has happened is that the, M the MP has been on leave of absence, and eventually when the case is settled one way or the other, well, then consequences follow. Minister Chan. Mr. Speaker, sir, just to put on record, an MP's allowance would be withheld once the MP is suspended from the service of Parliament as provided by Section 29, Subsection 3, read with Section 19 of the Parliament Privileges, Immunities and Powers Act 1962. A motion would have to be moved in Parliament to suspend the member from the service of Parliament. His or her allowance would be withheld thereafter. On Ms. Herting's rule, second question, can you repeat your second question or second part of your question? Sorry. Ms. Herting rule. Yes, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I think the question that I asked was um, Did CPI be um, apprise the Prime Minister or any other cabinet minister about the facts relating to the investigation to Minister Eswaran and you know, whether or not, uh, including uh, information about evidence that became uh, available? Thank you. C Director CPIB only apprised the Prime Minister. Ms. Hertingro, I assume you had raised your hand earlier. Was that the clarification you wanted? Thank you. Mr. Donby. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, SQ to Minister Chan. In the event if a perm sec or a director or a chief executive of a state board is being invited to assist with any investigation, will he or her be asked to take leave of absence? Thank you. Minister Chan. Mr. Speaker, sir, the answer to Mr. Don Wee's question is it depends on the circumstances. The Public Service Division, together with the Head of Civil Service, and if need be, the Minister in charge of the Public Service will have to make a decision in context. Ms. Sylvia Lim. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I have two clarifications um, for Prime Minister. Um, for Prime Minister, two clarifications, please. Um, I don't think Prime Minister has answered the question as to why it took so long to make arrangements to hand over uh, the residents of uh, Kampangan Chai Chi uh, to others in Marine Parade GRC from February to July. Uh, he has not answered why it takes so long. Uh, that's the first clarification. The second clarification is that I wonder whether he will agree with me that um, the period from February to July actually was quite momentous. Many things happened in Parliament. Um, we had budget debate, COS, Parliament was prorogued, Parliament reopened, there were sittings in April, May, and some of us even went with uh, the former Speaker on official trips overseas. So does he not think that this inordinate delay to settle the matter is really highly regrettable? Because it gives a false impression to all of us here, to the general public and even to the outside world. Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, as I have said, if I could play it again, I would have acted earlier. Ms. Kerry Tan. Uh, Mr. Speaker, sir, I thank you for um, giving me this opportunity to speak. I would like to address, uh, on a different tone, some matters of the heart pertaining to the issues that uh, PM has addressed today. Uh, I have three clarifications. Two of them pertain to the practicality and sustainability of ensuring that there can always be good talent uh, in our politics. And the last question pertains to the threats to the trust and the social compact between our citizens and the government. <coughs> Um, as I need to give some context to these questions, may I beg your indulgence for a little time? Don't, don't test it too much, though. <laughs> okay. Right. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I think uh, younger people, when they receive the news of what happened, um, specifically the uh, EMAs, uh, in their idealism, they may struggle to reconcile their expectations of their, towards their political leaders with them as human beings 
who have lives, who have complicated feelings, relationships, um, and personal lives. And the reality of an MP's life is that we often disappoint our spouses or children who may be waiting at home on the weekends at, or at night when we get held back at work, at events, at contingencies in the constituency. And some couples and families... Ms. Tan, I would appreciate if you yeah. go straight to your clarification. Yes, with that, you. with some families withstand this better than others. So my question is, how can we make political representation more sustainable and family-friendly in Singapore? And two, um, Sharing a little bit of personal context, I personally would not have decided to enter politics in 2020 if I had not by then found a partner that I decided to, I plan to settle down with. So for any political candidate who is still single uh, and have not yet found a life partner upon entering politics, it's the fact of life is really hard to date or to find potential partners. So is it possible that we can allow politicians some space for their personal lives away from public scrutiny so that just for the sake of ensuring that there will always be willing and capable candidates, albeit single, willing to serve as politicians without being, in reality, doomed to singlehood pretty much until they're past their prime. Right, and the third point is um, the internet is rife with a lot of false information and opportunistic narratives, and the way algorithms on social media platforms push info onto our feeds, also perpetuate personal bias and social polarization. So as much as there are many young people who are quite discerning about this, there are a vast majority who are rather passive consumers of certain narratives and information. So what can we do to better protect our young citizens from being confounded by social media consumption that has the power to cause disillusionment or apathy towards the system? Again, this is a point that I would like us to consider and seek um, leadership guidance on um, the prevention of cynicism and apathy from setting into Singapore society towards our political system. Thank you. Minister Chan. Mr. Speaker, sir, I thank uh, Ms. Kerry Tan for her exposition. I think we can understand where the member is coming from. We have clear rules of propriety and probity. They do not conflict with the aspirations for our personal and family lives. We know the public's expectations for public figure is high. We aspire to live up to them. Where we fall short, we seek to improve. Where we have done well, we must remain vigilant and not complacent. There will be personal sacrifices. Ultimately, the will to answer the call to serve is deeply personal. And I agree, we can all do our part to encourage a positive political environment and gender a more constructive political culture so that we don't deter good people from stepping forth to serve. Associate Professor Jim Islam. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Prime Minister mentioned earlier that there were two keys for the CPIB. Uh, the Prime Minister, and failing which, uh, one could go to the President. I'm wondering if the PMO has considered potentially extending uh, this institutional reporting line beyond uh, just essentially one branch of government, which is the executive branch. Given that it's also a judiciary, and I believe in Brazil, for example, the so-called car wash investigations actually reported to judges, uh, as well as possibly a legislature. So in Australia, the National Anti-Corruption Com Commission is actually overseen by a joint select committee. Prime Minister. I'm very happy to note that Mr. J Associate Professor Jameis Lim appreciates the second key and se is seeking a third. And I hope that it portends a change in your attitude towards the elected president and his custodial powers. But I would, I think the Brazil example is a very interesting one. You have safeguards, you've got judges involved. But if you have heard of Lava Hato, car wash, it's one of the, what do they call it, the mother of all corruption scandals. 
So the solution is not to be found in more and more and more and more layers of checks and balances. The solution is to be found in honest people with integrity and conviction and courage to make the system work with a reasonable degree of redundancy so I don't have a single point of failure. And that is what we have done. Mr. Zulkanan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is uh, for Minister Chan. Thanks for answering the question on Ministerial Code of Conduct. In the UK, the Code of Conduct is always revised uh, at the start of every new administration. And um, there's a setting out of the possible sanctions as well. Um, would the Code of Conduct for Ministers be similarly reviewed more consistently and perhaps the sanctions available to be expressly stated up for any breaches? Thank you. Minister Chan. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I uh, make three points in response to Mr. Zukanan's uh, suggestion. Today, the Code of Conduct is gazetted, but the sanctions are not spelled out. So it's gazetted. The second point is that we take the point we will and continue to regularly review the Ministerial Code of Conduct and all the other regulations that safeguard our system, and we will do that. But the third point follows on from what Prime Minister have said. And I think I have also shared this. We need to have good rules, but ultimately the rules by themselves cannot be sufficient. We need good people, good people that will abide by the spirit of the rules, good people that will interpret the rules, and not people that will try to go around the rules, if you like. Um, and what is the ultimate sanction? In my mind, I think in our political culture, the ultimate sanction is not whether someone's commit a, a mistake and pay a certain fine or others. The ultimate sanction is what will the public think of us as legislators, as part of the leadership team of this country. And we must do what we can to uphold the standards, whether the sanctions are codified or not codified. Any last clarifications? Mr. Long Man Wai. Thanks, Speaker. Um, first of all, one technical issue. Um, the, the Minister Izaran, can I ask the, the uh, Minister Chan, that Minister Izaran was put on leave of absence since the 6th of July. If, I, if I'm right, uh, 6th of July. But he actually, oh, no, no. Yeah, that was his personal leave of absence. Yeah, okay. That was his personal leave of absence. But, but on 5th of July, the Prime Minister and the government already know that CPIP has requested to investigate him. In fact, the Prime Minister knows that the CPIB has been investiga investigating him informally since May. But the formal investigation will start after getting concurrence from the Prime Minister uh, on the 5th of April. That, that's what I understand. Eh? So, but he was on personal leave of absence. And then during the period of personal leave of absence, he went to represent Singapore to meet the Chief Minister of Johor. This kind of practices, you know, just now I actually fully support what the LO said just now about the standards of the government, about delays, about indecisions and all that. But this is another, another example, right? If you already know the minister has been under investigation for so many months, why do you still let him go and visit? represent Singapore to meet up with the Chief Minister of Johor. Thank you. Minister Chan. Mr. Speaker, sir, I think both the Prime Minister and myself has set out the process of investigation. And when we use the word investigations, I think the Prime Minister and myself have gone through the different stages of investigations and what are the associated actions that we may take 
in accordance to the needs of that stage of investigation. It doesn't mean that just because somebody is under investigations, all things will follow immediately. And I hope we have made that clear in our presentation. And that is the context of how the Prime Minister has judged what duties Minister Iswaran can undertake at different stages of the investigation process. Mr. Leong Man Rai, short clarification, please. Uh, speaker, sir, uh, with due respect, sorry, I still have quite a number of questions. So I ask one more question first, okay? Yeah. Um, in, uh, I, I noted the uh, Minister Chan's reply, but by having all these delays in making the, the decisive, taking the decisive actions, um, for, um, don't you think that this is not in line with the government's stance of zero tolerance to uh, corruption? The moment a minister is investigated, even informally, I think more decisive action should be taken. Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I think we should have a sense of reality. In information comes up. A minister is quietly being investigated. Should the CPIB tells me as PM, should I straight away tell the minister, by the way, CPIB is quietly investigating you, please have a care? It's ridiculous. Supposing I say you go on leave of absence, why? What, do I, what reason do I give? He's working. He's being investigated. It's my duty to make sure that while he's working and knowing that there's a cloud, he doesn't make any steps which are going to dig the hole further or cause a problem. And if something like that threatens to come up, I will have to find some way to head it off. Why does CPIB need time to get ready for a formal investigation? Because they must have all the facts and evidence before you enough to start interviewing the, the principal person. Otherwise, if you go in and the principal person turns up and you've announced that you've arrested him and it turns out that there's nothing in the case, I think you have been derelict in your duty. So you must make sure there's as much as, much as possible that the case is there before you go to the minister. And when do you go to the minister? That depends on CPIB's operational considerations. Who is in town? How do they want to mount this? What else they want to do at the same time? I defer to them on these operational judgments. They know exactly what they are doing. They have a good track record and a formidable reputation. I rely on them. They asked for permission on the 5th of July. I gave it. On the 6th, I said the timing is entirely up to you. They said they need a few days. They acted on the 11th. And that's all there is to it. We, the reason this is here at all is because this government decided to act own self, check own self. Otherwise, it wouldn't even be here. At some point, it may have come out and then it we would have a bigger problem, but it is, didn't get worse, and we have started this very serious investigation because our system worked and we picked up that something was wrong. And that is how the system is meant to work, and that depends on the leadership, on the government, on the whole ethos of our society, to frown on corruption, to have no tolerance for somebody who falls short of the standards we expect. And when something needs to be done, painful or not, we do it. No ifs, no buts, it has to be done. It has to be done. Do you think I was pleased when CPIB told me that one of my ministers needed to be investigated? I was disappointed, I was saddened, but the director knew, I knew, said, you do your duty. I will back you, and I will enable you to do your duty. And I think that's what we, as this parliament, ought to adopt as our attitude. Rely on them. They will do 
their job, and in due course, everything will be settled. And I think that's the way we keep Singapore working for a long time to come. Mr. Leong Manwai, I would also suggest if you have a few, ask all of them at one go. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, I respect what the uh, Prime Minister has said just now with regards to the stance of the current government, but I would also like to make a point that if our current system is not own self, check own self, but there are more check and balances, perhaps there won't be delays in all these things. <laughs> of course, it's conjecturing, yeah. Okay, I ask two more questions to the Prime Minister, which are important for, my mo for our motion debate afterwards. Can I confirm with the Prime Minister that, so what he's saying now is that in with regards to uh, uh, Speaker Tan's case. So what Prime Minister is saying now is that in February this year, he didn't actually accept the resignation. He, he say, basically, he's saying that the resignation is put on hold and you carry on doing what you need to do. Can I... Uh, can I uh, uh, have that confirmation? Because if you have accepted the resignation and then you allow Speaker Tan to continue to perform certain duties, I don't know, the legal colleagues, uh, uh, members in this chamber may, may have other questions that can raise pertaining to this issue. So this one point I'd like to confirm so that I can say the right thing during the uh, motion debate afterwards. Second point, can the Prime Minister confirm that he would not have asked Speaker Tan to resign, even after the revelation of those offensive comments that he had made in Parliament, if Speaker Tan had not been in an inappropriate relationship with an MP? Thank you. Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, sir, first, um, Mr. Leong is quibbling over words. In February, Mr. Tan Chuan Jin told me I offered to resign. I said, yes, sort out your constituency first. In other words, decision taken, the moment to execute it, I will decide. So it's quite clear. Legally, he has not resigned. In terms of the decision made, I have decided, he has decided. Uh, would, have, would I have asked him to resign if it was just a matter of the hot mic? The answer is no. It was wrong for him to say that. It was bad that it was picked up. Uh, it lowers the tone of the chamber. No member should say that in the House. Dare I say, no member should say that even outside of the House. But I hazard to guess that maybe not all of us abstain completely all the time. And but we do expect standards of behaviour in this House, and especially in the Chair. And what he said was wrong, but I do not, would not have considered that alone a basis to ask him to resign. Mr. Leong Manwai. It's not new. It's a further clarification, I assume. Uh, no, <laughs> Speaker, one more question. Okay, oh, uh, maybe I, I would really comment? appreciate if you ask all, because there are still a few more hands, and I want to give everyone an opportunity. Okay, okay. this is the last question, Speaker. Thank you. Um, may I ask the um, uh, Speaker, through you, uh, ask the Home Minister, whether anyone applied for a permit to conduct surveillance on the two WP politicians under the Private Security Industry Act and if not, will the police conduct any investigations to determine if any laws were broken? Thank you. Um, Mr. Shamugam, Minister. I suppose the question, I think, is 
directed indirectly to me. Um, sir, can I ask through you, uh, which provision of the Private Security Industry Act is Mr. Leong referring to? I just want to understand the provision so that we can be clearer. Um, then I can answer the question. I, I just tried to pull it up as he was speaking. Uh, speaker, in reply to the minister, actually I do not have the specific uh, section of the uh, uh, Private Security Act, private investigation and all that, uh, but as a layman, I'm just concerned that any one of us in the public space can be secretly taken, you know, and, and it's... To know which provision. If I can have that, then I can proceed to answer. Okay, Speaker, then I would say that I have no provision, but can I ask for a general opinion of, from the uh, Home Minister that whether such act of secretly taking the, the, the video of innocent, I mean, uh, taking the, the, the video of s other citizens um, is... How is it covered under our law? Because it's an intrusion into a private privacy of the individuals, right? If you, I would say, sir, through you, that if Mr. Leong believes and PSP believes that there should be no videos taken of anyone uh, as a matter of procedure and law, perhaps he can table a private member's bill. Because as far as I am aware today, there is no legislation. Uh, last Saturday, <coughs> PSP came to my constituency. As is usual, they sat in a corner and had their coffee. My people were there, uh, welcomed them. Uh, and then I did my usual walkabout, and uh, PSP sent someone to video me. Obviously, they didn't think that they were breaking any laws. And I have a photograph of that if uh, Mr. Leong wishes. So certainly your party doesn't think that there is anything wrong in constantly videoing us. Um, so if you believe that, uh, and I, I think if I, my recollection serves me right, Mr. David Ong, who was an MP here, uh, was subject to a private investigator's video and um, by the uh, husband of the lady involved. Uh, so I think the reference to Private Security Industry Act, uh, I would just say this uh, through you, which I've said before. If a question is to be asked, we as ministers have a duty to answer. But I think equally MPs have a duty to do some basic check before they throw questions. I mean, if you refer to a legislation, then tell us which provision are you referring to? I mean, something must have gone through your mind that the Private Security Industry Act is relevant. I did a quick check. I don't see anything there that's relevant. So maybe I thought you knew something that I didn't know. But it appears that perhaps you know even less, even though you ask the question. So I think it will be a waste of very important parliamentary time if MPs don't do some basic research. That's all that I have to say, sir. I don't believe any section of the PSIA applies. Ms. Sylvia Lim. Thank you, Speaker, for letting me ask another clarification. <clears throat> um, to the PM and perhaps Minister Chan as well, I think the issue of um, whether PM's concurrence is required for any CPIB investigation is an important question. I've tried to search for the legal basis for that, but I cannot find any section which actually says that the director CPIB, CPIB has to get the PM's concurrence. The Prevention of Corruption Act talks about seeking concurrence from the public prosecutor, but the PM is actually not mentioned in, in the legal provisions as far as I can find. So, so may I get clarification as to whether it's just customary because um, CPIB comes under PMO that the CPIB would inform PM of such? Uh, and Minister Chan did say he's going to make a clarification on this point, so I'd like to know when that will happen. Minister Chan. Uh, 
Mr. Speaker. So, uh, indeed, thank you for the chance for me to make this clarification. So, I will say the following things in response to both uh, Ms. Lim's uh, comment and I think it was Ms. Her's question. I think so. Uh, whether we need permission. So, first, CPIB, if, it, if CPIB seeks the PM's permission and if the PM denies that, our rule says that the PA, CPIB, Director CPIB, can go to the President. And if the President gives his or her approval, CPIB can proceed. So that's the first point. The second point is that in our record, over the last many decades, Director CPIB has never been denied by the PM, this PM or previous PM, to continue and proceed with his investigation. So that's the second point that I will make. The third point, and I've confirmed with CPI, Director CPIB, when the PM says no, they can proceed with the investigations and make the case to the President. Right? So that's why, as PM enunciated just now, there's the two key. One is the pre-PM whether he agrees, and then after that, the president. Then the question you pose is, what if the PM and the president both do not agree with the director CPIB? And I think PM has made that clear. So I just want to make these points on record. Mr. Raj, Joshua Thomas. So, uh, if I may just seek clarification on Mr. Leong's question on private investigators. Um, well, technically, it is out of order, actually. I was going to rule it. Um, you want to ask a clarification to Mr. Leong's comment about... Yeah, yes, sir. And, and, and also to clarify what uh, Minister Shan uh, had said about the, about the Private Security Industry Act. Okay, I'll make an exception. I'll allow this. Yes, sir. And I'm really uh, I'm asking the question because I'm the president of the Security Association of Singapore, which also represents uh, private investigators. So uh, the clarification that I wanted to, to make was uh, whether Mr. Leong was conflating uh, the use of private investigators and the general taking of uh, videos in, in public. So the Private Security Industry Act does provide that in the event that there's a security uh, assignment or private investigation assignment involving a political figure, uh, which is defined as the president, the prime minister, a minister or minister of state, um, then there is a requirement to get the approval from the licensing officer. Uh, but uh, in, in other cases, which, uh, which is what um, Minister Shan mentioned, uh, where there were people who took a video of him in public, there's really no need uh, for that, and, and the private security industry act would not apply. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the clarification. Any last questions? Mr. Bikram Nair. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Now, I have a clarification for the Leader of the Opposition, um, arising from his earlier invitation, um, where he said he's prepared to answer any question about his party's handling of the uh, indiscretion between his two party members. Now, there is evidence in public of a video by Mr. Pereira's driver who said that he had told Mr. Singh, as well as other MPs, including Ms. Sylvia Lim and Associate Professor Jameis Lim, about the indiscretions Mr. Pereira was engaging in, including going to hotels, going to restaurants, and so on. Now, could Mr. Singh please tell this House why nothing was done at the material time? That's the first clarification. The second clarification is, were any steps taken to protect the identity of the driver as the informant? Leader of the Opposition, Mr. Pritam Singh. Uh, first one, I think I... Can I ask the member in return, has he perused the entire press conference that was given by the Workers' Party on this matter, where the question was answered? Uh, I have listened to the press conference, but I have not heard any explanation as to why the driver was not called up for an interview after those details were given. Nor, have I, nor was there anything in the press conference that addressed the issue of whether steps were taken to protect the driver's identity as informant. Mr. Pritam Singh. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Firstly, the invitation to ask the question about any matter involving uh, what had happened in the Workers' Party between Mr. P uh, Pereira and uh, Ms. Nicolcia was put to the Prime Minister, but I'll answer the question that the member has put forward. We made an assessment of the circumstances in which the driver came forward with the information. Uh, there was certain, certain information that I had received after the fact that he had secured the phone numbers of many Workers' Party members and circulated this allegation to many members, significant number of members across the board. Uh, we approached Mr. Pereira. I approached Mr. Pereira with uh, the information that was given to me by the driver. Uh, I had explained in my press conference what was said uh, by Mr. Pereira to me. And our assessment at the time was this was what had transpired. But if the member had listened to the press conference carefully, and I don't think he did, other facts came to bear, such as corroboratory evidence. I think a Stomp article suggested that this video was the video that came out on the same day that the Prime Minister was announcing the resignation of uh, the Speaker and Cheng Li Hui. Stomp reported that the video had been going around since 2021. I can confirm, because I asked the CEC the question, my CEC, had anybody seen the video? Nobody had seen the video. Maybe the member had seen the video. Perhaps he can tell me if he had. Uh, what had transpired in terms of what was shared, there was no corroboratory information for us to work with, and there was no other source. Now, if either of these two criteria came into play, then I think something different would have happened. We would have had to look into the matter more carefully beyond what Mr. Pereira had shared with us. In terms of protecting the identity of the source, I didn't reveal the identity of the source, but I had to check with Mr. Pereira. This is the information I've received. Can you, can you confirm? Mr. Vikram Nair. Okay, I can confirm that I did not see the video uh, before it was well all over the public domain, but I have a few further clarifications. Don't you think that if you receive credible evidence from someone who is close to an indiscretion, I mean a whistleblower, this is how issues normally come up, that you should actually take efforts to interview the person to get more information? Was that done? The second is this. Now, you mentioned that you did not tell Mr. Pereira or you did not reveal the source of information. How did you tell Mr. Pereira you came to know about his indiscretions? Did you say the driver told you? Mr. 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 Speaker, I don't recall exactly the whole circumstances of my conversations with Mr. Pereira, which happened uh, some time ago now. But on the first point, can you just uh, repeat the first point? You had a first question. Sena. OK. The first question was, if you receive information from a credible source who is close to the wrong circumstances, with which the information was provided to us. And as we found out after the fact, of course, uh, this person was a former police officer, more than, well, I think, 10 years' experience. I think this was in the papers. I would have expected somebody close to Mr. Pereira, very close to Mr. Pereira, to have corroboratory evidence at hand. I would have expected that, especially him being a driver. OK, Mr. Nair, last clarification. I think Mr. Singh has not answered my question, which was, did he call him up for an interview? Was it conveyed to him he needed to collate further corroborative evidence? Easy answer. The answer is no. Uh, Mr. Lim Biao Chuan, you have a clarification. So if I can just uh, ask uh, Mr. Leong Man Wai, earlier he had said something about um, if a MP is under investigation, um, he expected the government to do something about it. So can I ask Mr. Leong to clarify, uh, is it his position that if any MP is under police inve investigation, 
we should then uh, suspend the MP or dock his salary. Mr. Leong Man Wai. Uh, speaker, sir, uh, my answer is um, just now I mentioned minister, but I think it should also extend to all uh, uh, political uh, office holders and politicians. Um, and I didn't... Um, what I say was that um, when the minister is under investigation, and in this case, it's not just an ordinary investigation, even if it's an informal investigation, for CPIP to undertake and then, and then keep the uh, uh, minister, uh, the prime minister informed, it is something quite serious. I would expect our government's stance on zero tolerance to include what I say just now. That means once the minister is under investigation, he should be relieved of his duties. That is, of course, my opinion. Yeah, thanks. Mr. Lim Bell Chan. Um, let, let me ask Mr. Leong again, because I recall that um, Parliament referred the leader of opposition to be investigated by the public prosecutor. So, now, nothing has come out of that, but supposing, um, is it Mr. Leong's position that well, leader of op opposition cannot receive pay or carry out duties because he's a member of parliament? No, no, I'm not saying that. <laughs> but I'm asking Mr. Leong, because to, to me, uh, surely it must be, uh, you must be convicted before something can happen. You're, you're saying that the minute a person is referred to the police for investigation, the, the MP must be suspended or he must receive a salary cut. Is that Mr. Leong's point? I just want to assure a leader of opposition that wasn't my position. Mr. Leong Man Wai? Yeah, Speaker, maybe, we, we clar maybe I clarify that. I'm saying this pertaining to investigation by CPIB. Thank you. Minister Shamugan? So as I was listening to the uh, leader of the opposition, Mr. Singh, I thought we better have it clear, clear on the record. Because Mr. Singh said here on the record that he did not reveal the identity of the source to Mr. Pereira. Um, at the same time, he also has said Leon also shared with me that he was in an ongoing dispute with his driver and was about to terminate his services and had sought legal advice on the allegations of his driver uh, and a few other statements. So I think just to be clear, uh, Mr. Singh's position is that uh, he didn't reveal the identity of the source. That's what he just told us to Mr. Pereira. Thank you, sir, to, for the clarification through you. Mr. Pritam Singh. Uh, sir, as I mentioned earlier, the driver had been circulating this message in his name to multiple members of the Workers' Party. I don't think he was interested in protecting his identity. But in so far as the question directed to me, like I said, the conversation with Mr. Pereira, Mr. Pereira would have known who that individual was when I would have asked him. But I didn't actively go and seek to do something nefarious. Uh, Mr. Patrick Tayu, I hope your clarification is related to the ministerial statement. Just a question for the Minister of Civil Service in charge of civil service. I think the recent speed of events has affected the morale of the public service officers, and I want to hear from him what the response that he has as Minister in charge of civil service. Minister Chan. Mr. Speaker, sir, I thank Mr. Patrick Tay for the question and his support and concern for our colleagues in the public service. It's an important point. I'm acutely aware that these de recent developments that we discussed at length in the House today may have caused uncertainty and dented overall confidence in our public service 
and also amongst some Singaporeans. Indeed, I have received similar feedback from our public officers. Some wonder if the recent incidents had impacted confidence in our government and at the same time created doubts in the work of our public service officers. Others have asked me if they can still do their jobs well and without fear, especially amidst greater scrutiny. As the Minister in charge of the public service, I have assured all our public service officers that they do not need to fear. As long as they continue to do their jobs conscientiously, professionally and faithfully. I say this at the Public Service Week. Maintain our conviction, uphold our integrity and aspire to the highest standards for Singaporeans and Singapore. So long as they do the right thing, they need not fear. Because if they fear or if they start fearing, then this will be the end of the public service as we know it today. And I strongly believe, and I share this with my colleagues in the public service, that our work in the public service is not measured by the here and now, but over the long term. Our commitment to all Singaporeans is that this public service of ours will do right, not just for the short term, but also for the long haul. And we will also acknowledge, like anyone else, that we are not perfect. But if there are things that we need to improve on or work on, we will do so and not hide behind excuses. We will continue to do what is right and right what is wrong. Because the interests of Singapore and Singaporeans must be at the forefront of everything that we do. And I thank everyone for your support for our public service in these difficult moments. You can have my assurance that the public service will continue to learn from the recent episodes, apply the lessons and strive to do even better for Singapore and Singaporeans. Order, end of ministerial statements, introduction of government.